Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Joan Tollefson. And I'll just start by reading a little bio that Joan sent me, and then we'll get right into it. Um, Joan writes and talks about the ever-changing, ever-present aliveness of here slash now, which is, which is obvious, unavoidable, and impossible to doubt. She has an affinity with Advaita, Buddhism, and radical non-duality, but she belongs to no tradition or lineage. Her main teacher was Tony Packer, but Joan has also studied with several <coughs> Buddhist teachers and has spent time with a number of Advaita and non-dual teachers. She has been holding meetings on non-duality since 1996. In her books and meetings, Joan invites people to explore their actual present moment experience and to question the deep-seated assumption that we are each an independent entity encapsulated inside a separate body-mind looking out at an alien world. Instead, we may discover that everything is one seamless, boundless, unbroken whole in which there are no separate parts. Joan also invites people to question the deep-seated assumption that we are in control of our lives, or should be, and she points to the realization that everything is one choiceless happening. Joan is known for her honesty and sense of humor. Okay, we're going to put her to the test on that one. Here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you, you have a nice laugh, so that's a, that's a start. <laughs> um, so there are a couple of things that jumped out at me in this, uh, in this little intro that I just read. Um, one is that you wrote about the ever-changing, ever-present aliveness. Um, sometimes people refer to the never-changing quality of that, you know, and yet you use the word ever-changing. So why that? Well, I like to say ever-changing, ever-present. Mm -hmm. The ever-changing, ever-present here now. Um, because I notice that both aspects are true. Ah. This present moment, this, this is always, we're always here, and it's mm -hmm. always now. Right. And so this still point of here now is ever-present. Uh, but it's also ever-changing because what's appearing here is nothing but change Correct. and movement. I see. Okay, so that's why you throw both, this sort of paradoxical, so that's why you throw both of those in there. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Good. And uh, th another thing caught my eye, I was thinking about listening to some of your talks during the past week and thinking about how I would start this, and um, you say down here, a s question the assumption that we're each an independent entity encapsulated in a separate body-mind looking out in an alien world. and um, Somehow, when I listened to you, I was it got me thinking along those lines, and I have some thoughts that I want to kind of question you about. But I, we we could perhaps move in that direction by just asking you to define a couple of common words that we're likely to use in this interview and that everyone is using, just so that we have an understanding of whether we're both using those words in the same way and uh, whether we're using them in the way that people listening might be understanding them. And those words are you know, awake or awakening, people say I've had an awakening, and also the term enlightenment. Um, how would you define those terms? Mm. <laughs> 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 well, first of all, just to notice that they are words. Yes. And they point to something that's not a word, but they are words, and they get used by different people in many different ways. Um, so awake... I would say awake is just on the natural state, what's here right now, this mm -hmm. awakeness that's here undeniably here right now. And by that I just mean this present moment experiencing, this aliveness, this awareness, this awakeness that is undeniable. Um, and it's present whether we're lost in a train of thought or whether we're um, in a state of open, clear presence, so to speak. It's, it's this awakeness is just the natural nature of here now. That all beings ha have, including, mm. including dogs and cats. and. Well, uh, the notion of all beings having it is that's a thought. Yeah. Um, and I would say that um, what I'm talking about is not something that we have. It's what we are. It's, it's just what, what we is. are. Right. Yeah. But and then within that, there's the one of the things that's showing up here is the appearance of separate organisms, separate people, um, each of whom is presumably 
you know, has their own unique point of view, their own individual movie, mm -hmm. no two are, of which are completely the same. Um, but the awakeness, the awareness, the for me is the wholeness of being, the mm -hmm. the unicity, the undividedness. Right. The natural. Um, it's the nature of what is. The essential. Yeah, the essential nature of what is. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and but if you have, so if you walk have, up, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, we have the idea that that you know I am an individual unit of consciousness encased inside this separate body mind that was born into this outside world and lives here for a while, struggling to survive, and then one day dies and is not here anymore. And, you know, hopefully we think maybe my unit of consciousness will go on into another life or to heaven or something like that. Um, but that whole picture, um, that takes thought and imagination. Our actual experience is simply this awakeness that's right here, right now. And, um, and you know, every night in deep sleep, everything perceivable and conceivable disappears and there's no observer left to worry about whether I'm dead or not mm -hmm. so the fear of death is all sort of based on this notion of being this encapsulated unit and that's really I would say the the basis of our suffering mm. and so um, um, do you yourself uh, no longer perceive or regard yourself as an encapsulated unit? Well, that very question, of course, again, sort of recreates the the um, illusory problem that there's me who either still has this illusion or me who has now broken out of this illusion. And that's where we get into the question about enlightenment, mm -hmm. because often people think of enlightenment as me crossing some line in the sand where I will no longer be stuck in this illusion. Right. I will be free, and I will be experiencing myself as boundless consciousness or something. Mm -hmm. And while the all the other people, the seekers, are still lost in their in their illusory dream. And I would say that enlightenment is seeing through that whole picture. Mm -hmm. It's waking up from that whole picture and there's not it's not therefore it's not Joan who wakes up from that picture it's because that's what it's waking up from so it's just seeing it's it's noticing right now that there really is no such thing as Joan or Rick that's not I mean we've learned that I am Joan and you are Rick and and all this but that we had to learn that our actual experience if we come back to what's most basic and most obvious and most undeniable right now is simply this awakeness this presence this awareness and until we think there isn't really a Joan in the picture um, there might be a visual image of what I call hands and legs or if I look in the mirror there's a visual image of something that I've learned to call Joan but that appears here in the same way that the furniture appears here and the clouds appear here. Um, and if I go into my actual experience of this so-called Joan right now, this body or whatever, if I close my eye, if we close our eyes and just tune into our actual experience, we can't really even find this body. We can find sensations, but we can't really find a place where I end and the world out there begins. We can't really find a boundary between inside and outside. We can think of a boundary, but we can't actually find it in our, in our experience. So our actual experience is this one whole seamless picture. Yes, there's different shapes and colors, but it's one whole seamless picture, one whole seamless movie. And um, so there, the notion that Joan wakes up is the illusion that 
is being seen through. And I would say For me, that 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 wake, waking up happens now. It, it's not something that you know happened to Joan three years ago, or happen or might happen to Joan three years in the future. It's it's and it in fact doesn't even really happen. It's just noticing what's always already so. Um, does the story or the sense of being encapsulated Joan still happen here? Yes, it does. Um, part of that is functionally necessary. I mean, if you're going to cut up a carrot for, for your lunch, you have to be able to distinguish between yourself and the carrot or you're going to be in trouble. Yeah. Um, in order to plan this interview, you know, we had to be able to distinguish between Joan and Rick or we would not have been able to organize this. So um, if I couldn't distinguish between myself and my computer, I wouldn't be able to operate it. So there's a certain sense of being Joan that's functionally necessary and that appears as needed. And there's a dysfunctional, I would call it dysfunctional, sense of being Joan that also appears sometimes when I feel defensive or, or hurt, you know, if someone has insulted me. And I feel that sense of contraction and defensiveness and anger or whatever, that in that moment there's obviously there's some kind of identification as Joan as this entity. So yes, that happens sometimes. Um, are there people for whom it never happens? I haven't met such a person. They may exist. I don't really care whether they exist or not. I can only deal with what's right here. And as far as I'm concerned, even if, even if that experience hadn't happened for the last 30 years, I would still have no way of knowing whether it might not happen again in the next five minutes. So to say this is gone for good for me seems seems like delusion again. <laughs> it seems like again buying into the story of me. So and it doesn't really matter whether it happens or not. It's just another happening in this movie of waking life. Well, has the frequency or intensity of it diminished over the years as a result of all your involvement with spiritual things or whatever? I mean, you know, your tendency to get upset or defensive or whatnot. I mean, th looking back 30 years, perhaps that happened a lot more often and a lot more blindingly than it happens now, you know? Mm hmm Yeah, although just to notice that in order to in order to say that we have to go into thought and imagination and memory and we have to construct the story mm -hmm. of Joan moving through time <clears throat> and so it's a fictional story however relatively true it might be it's a fictional story and yes I could say you know this happens less frequently but that might be because I've just just because I've gotten older and wiser and you know might have nothing to do with um, the spiritual the meditation and the, and, yeah. and the you know spiritual work and therapy might, yeah might not but you do tend to see a perhaps a greater um likelihood or frequency of people for whom this sort of um you know development or experience or whatever word you want to use takes place who are who are involved in um spiritual things as opposed to just hanging out on the couch drinking beers every day uh, for decades uh, it does seem to have <laughs> its value in that way and and we can uh, we can safely assume that anything we're saying uh, you know about Joan or Rick or anything else sure it, on some level it's totally a story I mean that's a given but in order to actually have a conversation you know you do have to use these concepts I mean if we just want to bring it down to the level of pure being you know, we can just sit here with our eyes closed for an hour and a half, and it, it won't be much of an interview. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? But I, I, you know, I think this is the danger here is that, um, yeah, I mean, I think there are things that can be really, you know, helpful, relatively speaking, like meditation and so on. But, mm -hmm. but the danger in sort of making a cause and effect relationship is that, uh, you know, then it's like we set it up where you need to do something to get this or this is the desired goal and we're going to try to get there and that that way of looking at it perpetuates the very illusion that that we're waking up from which is yeah. that that you know we're trying to get somewhere else cuz actually 
wherever we go, here we are. This is it. This is it. And so um, it, it, it seems to me that we're very fixated in, in, our, in this culture anyway on self-improvement and, mm -hmm. and trying to fix ourselves and feeling like there's something dreadfully wrong with us. And, and of course, it does seem like there's a lot of things wrong with the world. And so um, to just notice that right now, this is it. This is it. This is, this is all there is. Mm -hmm. I think life is very paradoxical, uh, and talking about this stuff is very paradoxical because almost anything you say, you can you can say the opposite and and kind of see the see where that has its its significance also. Mm -hmm. and, and and neither one is sort of like the absolute complete truth that you could complete you know completely rest on and and without the other kind of having to say, wait a minute, how about me too? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. cause, cause that also. Yeah, I mean, that's, we can't, we can't ever capture reality. This, whatever this is, right now, right here, we can't capture it in words. No. You know, words can describe it, they can point to it, they can praise it and celebrate it, but they can't capture it. And, and, um, no matter how we try to say this, it's never quite right. Right. So, you can only sort um, of point yeah. the finger at the moon, but it's not going to be the moon. Yeah, so people say different things that sometimes sound like they're completely opposite and contradictory, um, but they may both be true. Um, yeah. So. Um, and so on the one hand, you know, there's nothing that can be done to broad bring about awakening. On the other hand, there are things that, one can do that apparently are conducive to awakening you know happening and and again it doesn't happen but then again it does you know i mean you can just go back and forth and back and forth i mean th there's this zen roshi you probably know his name i forget someone told me but he he said you know spiritual practice awakening may be an accident but spiritual practice can make you accident prone mm. mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and, you know, hearkening back to this, what you were saying earlier about an encapsulated being kind of looking out on an alien world or, or like this um, individual thinking, oh, I'm going to be so much a better individual when I get enlightened and so on. It's, it's kind of like the wave thinking, oh, man, I'm going to be such a cool wave when I, be, mm -hmm. you know, when I become oceany or uh -huh. something like that. <laughs> Whereas, in fact, you know, what ends up shifting and happening is, you know, one realize, uh, or the ocean realizes, wait a minute. I'm this totality, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I thought I was just a wave. It's, it, I, <laughs> I'm something which contains all waves. Yeah, and that you know, and every wave is perfectly what it is. It's mm -hmm. you know, so it's like you can't really separate. You know, again, in our conceptualization, we always want to divide things up. That's what thought does. Yeah. And then we want to, then we separate good and evil, and light and dark, and and enlightenment and delusion. And then we want to be sure that that I get to the sunny side of the street forever. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and have only enlightenment and clarity and um, and get rid of all the messy bad stuff and um, and you can't really pull them apart that way. Um, yeah. You know the fact that I spent a number of years in my early youth um, as an alcoholic and a and a drug addict mm -hmm. um, is just as much a part I feel of whatever insight has come about as years of meditation. Um, it you know you can't you can't pull them apart. But what I I I wouldn't advocate that anyone go and and drink heavily or take drugs, and and I don't advocate that anyone go and meditate either. Uh, I certainly wouldn't discourage it, and I sometimes invite people to explore the present moment or just be aware of the present moment in a way that could be described as meditation mm -hmm. or. I invite people to just be silent, right. um, but um, you know I don't I don't advocate any kind of path because what I'm really pointing to is that the totality is already here, here now is already here, and whatever is happening, it's all one whole happening, and everything that happens is an expression of that. So. 
And yet you yourself were on a number of paths for a number of years. A lot of Zen mm -hmm. and sat with this Tony Packer and, you know, some other some other things that you in, engaged in. Um, so yet you would say to someone who is considering doing some similar things like don't bother, it's all right here now? No, I wouldn't say don't bother. Uh -huh. I, I would neither say don't bother or <laughs> go out and meditate. But um, it's more just trusting how life unfolds um, and it unfolds for different people in different ways yeah um, you know looking back on my life you know one moment there was doing drugs and getting drunk another moment there was doing Zen very strict Zen practice another moment there was being with Tony Packer whose approach was very open and non regimented and explorative and Another moment there was, you know, going off to listen to radical non-dual teachers who um, said there's nothing to do, this is it. And, you know, another moment it was being in satsang with somebody and gazing into somebody's eyes. And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and so, you know, and then the mind afterwards comes, comes in and says, well, this caused that. But mm -hmm. that's, that's some kind of overlay. So it's, as I see it, this whole movement of life isn't really divided up into me and you and enlightenment and delusion. I mean, these are words and they point to something and they're functionally useful. So, you know, like enlightenment to me is, is seeing the wholeness of everything, seeing that everything is myself. There's only this one being. Mm -hmm. um, delusion is thinking that I'm encapsulated inside this body-mind, I'm a separate little entity and I have to, you know, defend Joan. Um, but this totality of here and now, this totality, whatever word we want to call it, um, includes both enlightenment and delusion. It includes... <laughs> Uh, yep. Light and dark, fast and slow, and hot dark. and cold, big and small, you know, all the it, parallels. All exactly, the and there isn't really an owner of any of these things. You know, the idea that I am deluded or I am enlightened is the mistake that enlightenment sees through. Mm -hmm. Delusion is the idea that I am deluded. Right. And, and certainly that idea can pop up sometimes. You know, there can be a thought, um, you know, I've ruined my whole life. I'm a failure. And in that moment, if that thought seems real in that moment, that's, that's delusion. <laughs> and, um, but it's, it's just another movement in, in the show. You know, there's sort of, it, it's a, it, you know, a kind of a, sometimes we think, oh, my goodness, that's delusion. I have to get rid of that, you know, so that I can be enlightened and never have that kind of a thought. And then I'll be okay. But that thought, again, is delusion. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you know, speaking of this totality, and we've alluded to it in, in, in various terms in, in the last few minutes, um, the wholeness, the totality, being, or whatever we want to call it. Um, I think, you know, some people, of course, would argue in, from a strict materialistic point of view that there is no totality or being or innate intelligence to life. It's all just a function of brain chemistry, and when we die, we die. Uh, and that's the end of it. But, um, you know, most people listening to this show would sort of uh, resonate with the idea that there's, you know, some presence, awareness, being, um, sometimes some attribute the quality of intelligence to it. And it's apparently given rise to this whole vast, complex universe where, you, you know, you can take a, a pinpoint at arm's length uh, with the Hubble telescope and see 10,000 galaxies in it and, and just, or you can go down to the microscopic level and see so much intricate complexity and fascinating, you know, mechanisms of the way things work. And I like to sort of think, and maybe this is just a concept, but it makes sense to me, that, you know, w w we human beings are, are, and all beings really, but uh, especially when you get to the human level, we're the instrumentality through which that intelligence knows itself or experiences itself. We're like the sense organs of the infinite, so to speak. And uh, are you with me so far? I mean, you, you want to differ from that uh, line of thinking or... Um, no, I can resonate with that. I mean, but just to notice that, however we, however we 
understand what's going on here, it is a conceptual picture. Yeah, well, Whether, we're talking, therefore we're involved in right, concepts. Right, but I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, to me, this is such a c crucial thing to keep pointing out because, mm -hmm. because um, you know, people sort of say, oh, yeah, of course, the map isn't the territory, the word water is not water, I know that. Yeah, but, yeah. but actually, we, that's exactly where, um, where we get caught again and mm -hmm. again is that these conceptual pictures start to seem very real and then you know pretty soon we're like really worried well what is going to happen to me if I fall off the edge of the earth you know <laughs> yeah. and which is just a false concept um, so this total when I say totality um, unfortunately as soon as we use a word it kind of makes it seem like we're talking about something and what we're actually talking about is not something. And in Buddhism, they, they often use the word emptiness, mm -hmm. by which they don't mean like a big, as I understand it, they don't mean a big empty room. They mean that everything is empty of itself. Everything is empty of solidity, empty of form. So, and then they say in Buddhism that a complete understanding of impermanence is that there's no such thing there's no impermanence hmm. because you know our first understanding of impermanence is that there's all these separate objects and they're all impermanent you know there's me and I'm impermanent but when you really see that there's nothing that actually forms as a solid persisting independent thing there's only flux and change then there is nothing to be impermanent because nothing you know the our picture is I am a I am this little boat that I'm steering down the water course of life rather than there's nothing but the water course there's nothing but the flow and and so you know we start to conceptualize what's going on here and we can think of it as consciousness or we can think of it as subatomic particles or we can think of it as a dream or you know we get all these different pictures conceptual pictures but right now you know what is this we don't really know and we can't really there's no word that really captures this whatever this is <laughs> well a physicist would tell us that what a physicist would concur with what you just said basically you know they take the water glass break it down go deeper 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 you get down to a point where it's all just sort of virtual fluctuations in the vacuum state or something and there is no water glass there is no water there are no molecules or atoms or anything else those are all sort of more concretized mm -hmm. uh, levels of reality which fundamentally have no substance or no no you know no me no real reality to them yeah so like we have an idea that there's like a brain Right. And then, and then we think, well, now is consciousness, you know, just to see how we ha how you have to have these ideas of separate things to come up with this, you know, there's a brain. Now, is consciousness in the brain, or is consciousness here before the brain? You can will, debate that. Will endlessly. consciousness still be here after my brain is dead, or won't it? That all these questions sort of presume that these things actually exist as separate, independent things, and. Yeah when you see that it's all one whole happening there's no question about will i survive death because there's no one here to survive or not to survive, survive or not survive it's it's right. just and, yeah. and or there's you know is consciousness in my brain or will it be here you know is my brain just like the tv that's picking it up and disperse you know all those questions again are are based on accepting our conceptual divisions of things well, that kind of that kind of gets to what I was leading toward there a few minutes ago, which is that, you know, if we if we really take it down to the most fundamental level, you know, either from the perspective of physics or these more metaphysical perspectives, um, you know, those both fields of thinking would concur that ultimately, there, as you say, there is no sort of individual. Uh, 
or individuality or anything else. It's all just one sea of whatever. Uh, but then there's that paradox where things appear to become concrete and uh, to individuate. Mm -hmm. and, and that seems to have its, you can't ignore that, as you say, mm -hmm. if you're going to cut carrots, you're going to cut your finger off if you <laughs> ignore that. <laughs> um, and it's, in, in Sanskrit, they have this useful term, which is mithya, which means dependent reality. And they use the example of a pot, where you have a pot, and it looks like a pot. You can turn it into a drum. You can hold water in it. You can put beans in it, whatever. But if you get right down to it, it's only clay. There is no pot. It's just clay. You know, so how can you say there's a pot? Uh, on the level of clay, there's no pot. But on the level of apparent reality, there is a functional thing that, that we call a pot. And so, I mean, and that, that illustration is used to kind of clarify uh, or what we're trying to say here which is that sure on um, if, if you want to take it to its ultimate this conversation isn't taking place the universe never manifested it's all just pure void as the Buddhists like to put it or fullness as the Hindus like to put it there's nothing ever happened you know I'll, I'll but, but if you want to have a conversation mm -hmm. then you have to somehow compromise or concede a little bit with um, with relative so-called realities uh, in order to actually have words, have thoughts, distinguish between you and I, and so forth. And, and, but you can kind of keep that in a larger perspective and, mm -hmm. and, and not get not buy into it too seriously. Yeah, and that seems to be, you know, what I do uh -huh. um, in my talks and books and stuff is to sort of um, keep reminding us of of the larger picture yeah. um, that that just seems to be the interest that the universe is manifesting here um, but as you say it's not it's not to deny relative reality um, you know there's that great story in Zen about it has a lot of different versions but it's something like before I took up Zen there were mountains and valleys and mm -hmm. and then after I started the practice of Zen there were no mountains and no valleys and then with enlightenment there were mountains and valleys mm -hmm. and it's like the middle stage the 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 sort of is the stage where you've realized the absolute you've realized that it's all one you've realized that there's no separation and and then um you know sometimes people think well that's that's all there is that it's all one and that but the in the the last stage in that story is that there's mountains and valleys again now is that the same as the first stage I would say you know the first stage is our ordinary view mm -hmm. um, in which we think that mountains and valleys are totally separate independent things that actually exist and persist through time as independent continuous things separate from each other the final view there are mountains and valleys but we see them as one whole happening yeah as inseparable aspects of one seamless whole happening and we recognize that the mountain is nothing but continuous change it's moving mm -hmm. I mean Dogen realized that centuries or however long ago he lived um, centuries ago um, you know he said the mountains are moving before mm. physics you know it, it, and it's true even things that seem very solid are actually moving and so there is there is certainly the appearance of you know someone named Joan who has um, progressed over a lifetime um, it's kind of like when you know when we when we listen to music um, if we just had the note that's in front of us right now if we just had that one note it wouldn't mean anything there w it wouldn't make any sense it wouldn't be there would be no beauty to it there would be no music you know it depends on the context, you know, the memory the, of the notes that came before. And, and yet each note happened now when it happened. And mm -hmm. the memory of it and the context is now. And so it all happens now. Yeah. But there's, there's, a, there's a sense of it unfolding in time. Mm -hmm. And we're not we certainly aren't going to deny um, the past, but but it's actually not back there somewhere the way we think it is, uh, any more than anything is out there somewhere. Um, the everything is right here, right now. 
and so there is this sense if you're watching a movie and all you have is the frame that's right in front of you this instant you wouldn't that wouldn't make any sense there'd be no movie so again there's this sense of a life story that's unfolded in time but it all happens here now and when you actually go looking for the past you know where is 20 year old Joan she's gone <laughs> she's gone she's totally stoned and she's just having this dream <laughs> <laughs> she's back there somewhere <laughs> <laughs> All right. Whoa, isn't this wild? What a long, strange trip it's been. Whoa, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I, this this kind of gets gets back to this point of paradox. Um, I think if a person kind of gloms on fundam in a fundamentalist way to, uh, you know, there is no story, nothing is happening, yada yada, um, it's it tends to be kind. Of, it kind of, and my wife is saying, and then how could you have a show? But it, it <laughs> tends to be um, kind of a, Im, imbalanced in a way, and, and you know this this thing of like Do, was it Dogen or Dogen or whatever his name was, Dogen. yeah, um, the mountains are there, and yet you know it's different than the sort of the the early rec, the early perception perhaps that all there was was mountains. You know he's kind of passed through the emptiness phase and then realized that the reality involves mountains which at the same time aren't mountains you know mm -hmm. uh, a body which is at the same time isn't a body a personality which at the same time you know it's it's like there's this paradoxical simultaneous recognition of um, absolute and relative together and forming a, a a wholeness that's larger than the sum of its parts as it were mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, so clearly, you know, in my opinion, some people do seem to get kind of stuck in the absolute uh, view, and, um, you know, they completely deny, I'm not Joan, um, <laughs> nothing's happening. Um, yeah, I mean, I would know, say to them, hey, send me all your money then, because you, you apparently don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, that's interesting, because there's an old... There's an old story in, in Advaita um, about Shankara, this, mm -hmm. you know, great Advaita master. Um, and, you know, he, I've heard different versions of the story, but basically something along the lines of, um, uh, you know, he's always saying that it's all one or it's all a dream or something right. like that. And yeah. so his students decide to challenge him and see if mm -hmm. he really believes this. And um, they get on an elephant, they charge him with an elephant, mm -hmm. and he jumps out of the way, right. and they say, aha, <laughs> yeah. you know, you don't really think it's all a dream, you don't think it's all one, and he said, well, no, that my jumping out of the way is part of the dream, my jumping out of the way is part of the one, is, is an aspect of the one, and so it's like um, the relative, mm -hmm. I would say the absolute includes the relative, it just doesn't get stuck in it, you know, but, yeah, but, um, it doesn't deny it. It's not anti. It's not against it. Um, yeah, I mean the ocean still has waves, even right. though it realizes it's an ocean. It doesn't just become this sort of crystal clear, placid. Right. You know. <laughs> right. And people often get the idea that you know enlightenment means that you could charge me with an elephant and I'm just going to stand there and you know let myself get flattened because right. there's no me here, and that. As far as I'm concerned, that's a complete misunderstanding of of enlightenment. Yeah, I mean, if you think of the Gita, um, there's all these verses in I don't know second or third chapter where Lord Krishna is saying how the there's really no author of action. The gunas of nature take care of it, and the and the realized person you know says I do not act at all, mm -hmm. and yet he's telling Arjuna get out there and fight this battle. You know, do mm -hmm. this intense action, but do it from the standpoint of recognizing that you are not the actor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I mean, boy, in in a way, I mean, some people kind of dismiss traditions these days, you know. But there's so many amazing stories in the traditional literature uh, uh, that really stretch you this way and that, and kind of in inculcate the appreciation of pa of the paradoxical nature of life. Mm -hmm. um, just when you think you have a a cozy uh, niche to sit to to cuddle up in that they, they hit you with something else that <laughs> shows you the complete opposite. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, that's how that's. I I think there's a lot of 
I think a lot of people who criticize things like Zen or meditation, the things they say about it often indicate to me that whatever version of it they encountered is really not the version I encountered. Yeah. Um, and and sometimes you know we we mishear what we're what a teacher is saying to us, um, or what some you know author in like who's dead in a book is saying to us, and then years later we hear it again. And we revisit it, and we hear it in a whole new way. So, uh, you know, um, you know, Tony Packer would say to people things like, um, "Can we see that that's just a thought?" She would ask it as a question, "Can we see that that's just a thought?" And and then people in their minds would often translate that into, um, "You should see that this is just a thought." And and Tony, you know, was from Germany, so she had a German accent. So it'd be like with a German accent too. Sounded you know? very authoritative. <laughs> yeah, you should do this, and, and you're bad if you're not doing this. We this have many ways of making you see that this is just a thought. <laughs> but that was not her. You know, that's not what she actually said. You know, right. so it's like, and that's what often happens is the mind. I mean, people feed back to me sometimes what they think I said, and it's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's got this subtle little twist in it that's actually completely changing it. So. Um, so I I do think think that there's you know tremendous beauty in in a lot of these traditions and in Zen and mm. um, Advaita and Buddhism and yeah I mean these guys really paid their dues and there's, there's you know and it's not to say that we we need to live in the past but there's there's certainly a lot of um, a lot of wisdom to be gleaned if you know how to interpret it uh, th on this point of uncertainty or or you know parrot paradox there's a nice saying from the bible where christ says uh says uh, for the foxes have their holes and the birds have their nests but the son of man has no place to lay his head mm -hmm. and um my understanding or interpretation of that is just that you know he he was beyond conceptual cubby holes you know uh there was no there, no niche in which you can sort of like say I've arrived and this is the the perspective. Um, it's funny because par people often feel like enlightenment or awakening is going to be a state of certainty. Like I really know the truth about things now. Mm -hmm. But but really, it's, it seems it's more of a, f a floating in a in a. In, in, isn't it in Zen they have this sort of "don't know mind" phrase mm -hmm. or something something like that? It's a, f a floating in lack of certainty. And it's more of letting go. Yeah, yeah, letting go, precisely. Uh, that's what Adyashanti was saying when I interviewed him just the other day. He said I even in his own life there's a continual letting go. Mm -hmm. It's like and he, he, and he doesn't even sometimes realize what he's letting go until after it's gone, and then <laughs> mm -hmm. like the Joni Mitchell song, and then he, he kind of realizes, whoa, that, that's gone, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's just, it's, it's, not, uh, it's the recognition that, there's an openness here that's actually the nature of here. Mm. This openness, this awakeness, um, is is not knowing. Yeah. Not it's that not that doesn't mean not knowing in the sense of you know being ignorant of the facts or something. But right. it, it's not knowing in the sense of of um, not grasping, not not clinging, not beautiful. Yeah. Not um, you know the the um, that seeking mind that's always that's always, you know, trying to get it, trying mm -hmm. to have some experience or get some understanding or figure it all out, you know, that it's the absence of that. It's the relaxing of that. It's, the yeah. letting, it's like, you know, it's like a fist that's been very tightly closed, suddenly just relaxing and opening. Mm -hmm. I think and, relaxing is an important word there. And paradoxically, <laughs> you know, what happens in this enlightened enlightenment or opening is the realization that this openness is so open and so all-inclusive that it even includes contraction you know that that enlightenment is the recognition that everything is included everything is myself mm -hmm. you know yeah. even delusion mm -hmm. is an aspect of this so um, but there is a tendency isn't there for human beings to want to contract and to grasp and to mm -hmm. to to seek certainty in uncertain things mm -hmm. you know it's like this fundamentalism is so insidious and and so universal really it shows up in so many ways i mean religion and politics and and neo advaita <laughs> and uh 
all kinds of things where we want to sort of uh, w we abhor uncertainty in, as a species it almost seems we we really want to sort of feel some security in a in a f in a fixed vantage point mm -hmm. and and ironically that makes us less secure because yeah. fixed fixed vantage points are always subject to being upturned and uh, mm -hmm. being uh, refuted it seems like it's a survival function you yeah, know, yeah that that in in a certain area of life it works very well you know mm -hmm. when we're trying to figure out how to take the bus from here to there it works very well um, but when we're you know looking for the nature of life or or love or happiness or freedom it it doesn't work yeah uh, I used to be a, st a student of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi for many years and he, he had this nice little talk he gave where he, he talked about how routine work kills the genius in man and he said that on the one hand, you need sort of practical, focused, you know, re repetitive uh, things in order to accomplish anything, in order to do your job or whatever. But on the other hand, he said it, it sort of kills the, the unbounded creative uh, dimension. And so he, he, the whole point of the lecture was that both need to be cultivated so that one can uh, remain in one's unbounded status while yet focusing sharply and, and doing what needs to be done in the practical world. So I don't know if we've gotten too conceptual on you there, but <laughs> it <laughs> seems to pertain to the point. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that, but... but yeah, okay. You know. <laughs> well, yeah, it's like you t taking a bus, for instance. You can't just sort of wander out in the street and right, just sort of no. take whatever looks like a bus and wherever it's going. You know, you have to be very practical. Well, where is mm -hmm. this bus going and is it going to get me there on time? And, you know, be quite specific and, and analytical about it. Yeah, no, uh, there certainly are both, both things ha are part of the functioning of life. Yeah. The, abil the ability to, you know, concentrate on something very narrow mm -hmm. and the expansive openness that um, relaxing into all of it are both aspects of life. And it almost seems, though, that um, unless there's some kind of recourse to or access to expansiveness, and like you're always saying, you, you say in your lectures, you're always reminding people back to that sort of, uh, I don't know what the word you used, but to sort of the unconditioned or universal uh, quality of things uh, it, but unless there's recourse to that one gets more and more and more habituated or more and more constricted and in, in, in more and more conditioned mm -hmm. to the point where there's level after level after level of conditioning very deep and very impenetrable um, and not necessarily easily seen through in an instant even though one, one would you know like to have that happen but it, it does take time sometimes for people to kind of work back through all that and and yeah, um, well, for things to be let go you know you well again you know it, it it takes time in a sense yeah and we can construct a story of that but it's actually immediate um, it there isn't really there isn't really anything to let go there's no one to let go. It's already happening. Um, you know, this movement of life or this infinite self-realization, whatever we want to call it, is already happening. It already is. And, True. You know, and we have um, we have a sort of a, an impulse to try to control it or manage it or something mm -hmm. or you know, which is also part of what's happening. But if someone had come to you at the nadir of your drug and alcohol days and said to you, Joan, there's nothing to let go, it's already happening, do you think you would have, you know, snapped out of it? I mean, wasn't there a sort of a, a heaviness or a, uh, you know, a, a depth of, of confusion that, that uh, wasn't just going to go in an instant? Um, well... Interestingly, it, it did seem to go in an instant. Oh, really? I mean, okay. Well, I mean, Tell me about you know, it. again, you can make up a story in which there's a process, or, mm -hmm. but it seemed like at a certain moment, um, you know, I, I can remember trying to stop a few times, but not successfully, and then suddenly, I mean, things just got really, really bad, mm -hmm. and... Um, there was a stopping and I went into therapy at that point and I could say well I sobered up through therapy <clears throat> and I don't know if I would have stayed sober without therapy at that point but but um, <clears throat> excuse me but um, 
but it seemed like it was just a switch that happened, you know, rather instantly. Um, and I can't really pin down what happened, and so. Um, but then you had years of therapy and Zen no, practice, only and a this, year of therapy. And so there, yeah, that and your Zen practice, all your spiritual things you did. Yeah. You know, which undoubtedly had a, a, a culturing influence. I mean, it must have. You didn't go from day one stopping alcoholism to where you are now. Uh, I mean. I, and I know this is very progressive sounding mm -hmm. and path sounding and individual sounding and all that, but you know again harken, getting back to the paradox point there there's i don't know you, you know where i'm getting at it's, it's, it's just uh, there seems to be like for instance, I had a similar story to yours, maybe not as dramatic, but I was re you know really into drugs for about a year and and one night I was sitting there on acid, and my mind was just all whirling around, bouncing off the walls and i I picked up a Zen book to to kind of focus my mind on something wholesome and I was you know reading reading the Zen flesh Zen po Zen bones mm. by uh, you remember that little book Paul reps yeah. right great little book and um and as I read it it dawned upon me these guys are serious and I'm just screwing around and if I keep doing this uh, I'm gonna live a miserable life so I thought that's it I'm gonna stop taking drugs gonna learn meditation and I'll see what happens and that to me was a it was a definite watershed moment you know a real turning point but you know, then having practiced meditation for 44 years, uh, I'm dramatically <laughs> different person than I was at that at that point, and it wasn't just aging. Uh, you know, there's there's been an influence, and yet there was something in my experience at that point, some element, some dimension or so, that's exactly as it is now. Same thing. You know, mm -hmm. there's no, nothing changed in, changes in that at that level of of life. Yeah, the, so the it's, it's it's both al end. It's always now, and everything that happened happened here. It's yep, like yep. The, in this still point of here now, it, the whole thing. So, and and all of it is this, like again, we conceptualize Rick who went through this process, or mm -hmm. Joan who went through this process, but that's a conceptualization, and the the actually there is no Joan apart from the whole rest of the universe. You know that it's one yep. whole movement, and so. Um, um, what interest you know what interests me is not sort of prescribing mm -hmm. a progressive path to people or saying you know this is what you should do mm -hmm. um, but pointing to the unfolding that's already happening that can't be avoided that happens by itself and you know for you and me what unfolded was um, stopping drugs or alcohol and and meditating. Yeah. Um, for various people that I drank with in the bar, that isn't what happened. Some of them are dead. Right. Um, Me too. And um, but that's you know that's all part of this one whole seamless movement and. Um, yeah, no, there's no denying so, that. I, w I wouldn't dispute that for a second. It's it's all part of the big picture. I mean, so, I just saw. I'm sorry. Go ahead. And it, to me, that you know, one of the most liberating thing that to me is the most liberating realization, mm -hmm. because um, again, you know, we we have this picture that I'm I'm trying to get to a place where I've gotten rid of all my neurosis, all my bad habits, all my addictions, all my compulsions, all sense of, you know, egoic, encapsulated Joan defensiveness, all mm -hmm. of that is completely gone, and all that's left is this wonderful, pure, um, radiant uh, Joan, you know, because there's a very much of a me in that picture, right. <laughs> radiant Joan, who's just, you know, exuding enlightenment and clarity and love in every moment, and everyone loves her, and, and she's always happy. And, um, Might as well throw in wealthy while you're at it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and wealthy, and, um, you know, and it, it's so liberating to really see that none of these um, neuro neurotic things, quote unquote, have to fall away. That's not right. to say that that I'm condoning uh, bad behavior or that um, I'm promoting it, but just that none of nothing 
has to be different than how it is. Nothing has to fall away. And that it's already here, that this, this seamless happening, this unicity, this being, whatever you want to call it, is already here. It's, it's what is. And, and um, for me, that has been very liberating. No, I, you know, I think and, it, yeah. And I, seeing that there's really no owner of what's happening and there's no, you know, it's not happening to me. It's not, you know, really getting that just, I often say, you know, there's different cities have different weather. You know, there's more cloudy weather and more thunderstorms in Los Angeles, in Chicago than there are in Los Angeles. Right. And we don't take that personally. That's just the weather. We understand mm -hmm. that it's just different conditions. And likewise, some body minds have more stormy weather, more... Yeah more tendency towards you know, addiction or whatever and a lot of these things that we used to think of as being uh, moral or spiritual failures uh, the more that we learn about neuroscience and whatnot the more we find out how much genetics and neurochemistry and the condition of the brain and all kinds of things play into in fact the whole universe plays into everything that you could say that everything is the cause and the effect of everything yeah. else you know so it's like to really get that there's no owner of what's happening here there's no um there's no thinker of my thoughts there's no doer of my actions there's no chooser who's making my choices my choices are unfolding they're part of this whole happening and they mm -hmm. happen by themselves um no, that's all good. Because I, that the picture that, you know, there's me in here, this, again, this discreet little unit of consciousness encased little, in this little body. puppeteer. Yeah. yeah, me who's steering my little boat through life, <laughs> you know, is it, tremendously, there, you know, that, that there's so much um, pressure in that, you know, to do it right and to get somewhere and it's never good enough and, and uh, to realize that you know the ocean you're already the ocean there that's all there is there you know there's and there's all kinds of different waves and the waves are always changing and it's yeah. all the movement of the ocean uh, is um it's a great relief it's a great relief yeah it takes a, a huge, load off your shoulders <laughs> it's a huge relief yeah. yeah and i think one of the pitfalls in progressive practices is that you know, and I'm not saying this is their intention, and certainly the best teachers of those kinds of things certainly see through this and mm -hmm. point point to seeing through this. But, but the pitfall in any kind of progressive path is that it kind of reinforces or can reinforce that sense that there's me who's meditating, and I have to, you know, I'm, I have to meditate correctly, and I have to meditate enough, and maybe if I meditated more and Oh, maybe if I went to another retreat, and mm -hmm. if I went to a few more satsangs, and if I meditated another few hours every day, and did a few more body scans, and this and that, maybe I could finally be okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I hear you. I mean, I live in a community where there's like three, four thousand people meditating, and um, I'm, I'm not officially part of that organization anymore. But um, there's very much in the psychology this car carrot dangling about, you know, five feet in front of you mentality, where oh, if I just get on the next course, or if I get this technique, or if I could just afford some Ayurveda, or take these herbs, mm -hmm. or you know, live live in a house that faces east, or all these <laughs> things are going to make a big difference. And uh -huh. and you know, someday I'll be enlightened. Uh -huh. And 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 then there's this edifice built up of what enlightenment is like, which the bar is raised so ridiculously high as to include the ability to levitate and uh you know, and so people think well i'm no nowhere near that so uh, i'm i'm pretty much going to give up hope for this lifetime <laughs> <laughs> and you know so it's it's definitely a progressive path to the max and um and i completely concur with you know the um the points you've just made and i think that on the flip side there can be the non-progressive path way too much emphasis to the point where there's sort of no appreciation for the potential value of some of these things that that can be um, conducive to 
you know, uh, awakening or you know, traditional practices and whatnot. I think there can be an overemphasis on that. And I, I, pro, to my mind, anyway, the, the healthiest approach is, is a, a balanced thing where the best of both worlds and, the, and without the um, pitfalls of either, if that, if that balance can be found. Um, well, well yeah. you'll love me then because that's kind of what I do is that balance. But, Good. But, well, but, I love you but, already. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, but just to, I, I find that there's a real place for the extremes also. That, that, that's true. That, you know. Uh, everything has its place. Everything has its place and there's, um, All you know. All well and wisely put. Like those teachers who just say, those uncom I call uh, you know radical non-dual uncompromising radical non-dual teachers who just say meditation is crap yeah. and um, actually very few of them say I don't know I can't think of one who's actually said that <laughs> in fact they all say meditation happens if it happens at least the uh, ones I'm familiar with yeah. but they certainly would would poo poo you know they frequently say things like you know you meditated for 30 years and it got you nowhere and, and just kind of put it down yeah. And and emphasize that that this is already it and nothing needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And and kind of um make mock and deride um progressive paths in some mm -hmm. way or other. But there's a place for that, which is that um you know, it really cuts that that um yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, and 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 when you compromise on it, when you which I do, you know, when you mm -hmm when you can sort of see both sides and mm -hmm. you know you don't hold that firm line you compromise and you're willing to sort of go in the other direction um, there's a certain kind of um, sword cut yeah. that, that that you can deliver with that kind of uncompromising approach and so and then you know as far as you know for some people it may be really appropriate to be on a progressive path where they really mm -hmm. believe that it's really important that they show up every day for zazen and you know that they go to their one or two sessions a year and that they have dokusan with their teacher x number of times and and blah 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 yeah that may be you know again it seems to me that that um you know we have kind of a desire to find the one true expression mm -hmm. and and to get it pinned down, you know, this mm. is it. This is the one true expression that kind of has it all. But actually, every expression is is an aspect of this seamless whole, and it all works together. You know, it's like my left eye sees a little differently from my right eye, and you put them together, and it's my whole vision. It's like yeah. we're all create. You know, we're all this whole vision, and so it's like there is a place for for. For everything, and, I, and speaking personally, um, I feel like all of those different things have been helpful for me at different moments. Yeah, no, and, I, I really appreciate you saying that, and uh, um, it's a definitely. A, I mean, I was sort of like guilty of violating my own little point there, and saying that the balanced way is the best. <laughs> yeah, you know, I say so you broaden my perspective just now, and. And we, I would broaden it further to say, you know, the fundamentalist Christians, the atheists, everybody else, just fine, you know, doing what they're doing. It's right for them. It, maybe it won't be right for them in 10 years. They'll do something else. But all these little, all these little facets are, are part of one big jewel. Yeah, it really is. It's one whole happening. And, and from the perspective of the universe, um, it's all very inconsequential, you know. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it, um, which doesn't mean, you know, I don't have my opinions about political things or. Uh, yeah, me you too. Know, I don't want fundamentalist Christians dictating what goes into the textbooks or something, and I'm, you know, I have right. a strong opinion about that. I don't want yeah. evolution taught in the schools. I'm not. Pardon you, me. Not you mean the creationism? Um, yeah, creationism. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, now someone will pick that out of this whole thing. <laughs> yeah, they'll cut that little bit. Joan said. <laughs> Joan says. I don't <laughs> <laughs> Just um, don't ever bother running for president. You're 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 cooked. <laughs> um, you're just saying you you're, you're, you're just saying you you definitely have your own um, you know p political philosophy and and convictions about things. Uh, you haven't become a. Uh, just a, a big 
ball of mush. Uh, you you know you have you feel certain ways about certain things, and but that's not in incom- that's just your expression. You're probably going you're probably going yeah. to say that's your particular flavor of exactly. Yeah. I mean, again, I think there's some people have the idea that um, non-duality or enlightenment or whatever means that you don't have any opinions anymore and um, you're just fine with everything and and um, again, I think that's a false picture that um, because there is a personality, there are opinions, there are preferences. I mean, it, it it's just seeing that that there's no one behind them, there's no one in control of them. It's like right. it's like uh, you know we don't choose what political views we have. You know, like I didn't choose to be a progressive or something. In fact, years ago when I was in high school or grade school or something. I mean, I was for Barry Goldwater. I was like mm. a young Republican. Well, and I think it's a good thing you took all those drugs then. <laughs> and then, yeah, somewhere <laughs> in there I switched, but I wasn't, it wasn't like there was anyone in control. You know, it's just like we don't choose our political, you know, certain news sources I think are completely full of lies and other news sources feel reliable to me. There are mm-hmm. other people who have exactly the opposite sense yep. of what's reliable and what isn't. And do we choose that? No, it's just kind of how we are by nature, by all of our, you know, and everything, our, you know, our sexual preferences, our political ideas, our opinions on things, it's all happening choicelessly. Do you Uh, think we have, this is, yeah, this is interesting, do you, I agree with you, Um, not that it matters, but, (laughs) but, uh, (laughs) but do you think there's like even, uh, one iota of choice i mean there, is there like a little like are we like a hundred percent or ninety nine percent like choiceless but there's one percent where we have a little bit of volition and we can kind of steer the boat like we're going on a down a fast river and we pretty much have no choice but to do that but we have a little bit of choice as to which way we we steer our canoe you know within the course of that river well um i think that you know we can't we can't put this happening into words mm-hmm. correctly. I mean, so whatever we say is a little bit wrong. Yeah. Um, I, what feels, um, so if we say there's no choice or there's choice, they're, they're both off in right. some way. Um, there's certainly the appearance of choice. I mean, it appears that I chose to say yes to your invitation to do this interview. Mm-hmm. Um, and it appears that you chose to do an interview with me. Um, and it appears that um, I chose to wear this um, shirt and that um, we chose to turn on these lights. Um, yeah. So there's the appearance of making choices. Um, you could call that rowing the boat or steering the boat. Mm-hmm. But how did all those choices happen and when we look back at when I look right now at where these words are coming from I don't find anyone back there who's authoring them I Mm. find them just coming out they just come even if I were reading a prepared speech that I'd written last night it would have just come out last night Mm -hmm. and I would have written the writing it down would have just happened you know the the whatever all went into you deciding to ask me to do this just came together and happened and, yeah and then similarly I get the email and um, for whatever you know reasons say yes mm-hmm. and it's it when you look at what where is that choice coming from I mean I often invite people to just really explore because it it really doesn't help to sort of try to think this out philosophically. So yeah. I like I like invite people to just watch as you make choices. From you the prob- you I'm know sorry, from the smallest choices like you know you're sitting down and you decide to get up mm-hmm. to something bigger like you know you decide to take a job or get married sell your or house something. or whatever yeah sell your house. Just watch as that choice unfolds and see if you can catch the decisive moment or if you can find anyone in charge of it <laughs> and what i what what's discovered here is that there's nobody running the show it's all happening hmm. so there's the 
there's certainly the appearance that you know that if if I want lunch I have to go in and do something you know it's I can't just sort of sit here and say well there's no choice I'm gonna wait for grace to <laughs> show up and provide me with lunch I could probably be hungry yeah. so so um, but when I look at what prompts me to do that and how it all unfolds I don't find any any central chooser in there mm. who's in yeah. control and in fact this is what neuroscience is finding more and more that I just read a really interesting book called Incognito which is mm. by a neuroscientist and he uses you know that that term a team of rivals that is in that book by that Obama used that term for his cabinet, oh, right, yeah. team of mm -hmm. rivals yes. in some history book. Anyway, Abe he, Lincoln, he got it from Abe Lincoln, yeah. Or Doris that Doris he, Kearns Goodwin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, this neuroscientist who wrote the book uses it for the brain that the brain is a team of rivals, and mm -hmm. um, so even on that level, there, there's no, there's no, ex they haven't found any sort of entity in there who's, who's. Uh, yeah calling the shots and so um, to understand that it's all happening by itself as one whole happening choicelessly is very again very freeing and liberating because you really see that that you know if that I can't do anything other than exactly what I'm doing I can't want anything other than exactly what I'm wanting or thinking and and the same is true for other people. I mean, if we really got this, you know, our whole legal system, our political world, it's all based on the idea that everybody has free choice. You know, <laughs> if we really got that somebody committed murder, didn't have a choice, we might still lock them up to protect the community, but we wouldn't, you know, feel like, oh, we're going to punish this person because they should have done better. Yeah, yeah. And um, so that's very liberating. But if, if this is misunderstood, you know, and then we sort of slip into this thing of where the mind thinks, aha, not having a choice, that's the correct spiritual position. Right, and so I'll be so wishy-washy. I am going to really try hard not to do it, not to be choosing anything. Right. So, um, you know, so let's see. Um, well, I can't, I can't go to the retreat because that would be a decision and that would be doing <laughs> something. And, and, um, <laughs> and, and all of that, if you look, is also just happening, you know. Right. Or one uh, might say, well, there's really nobody ch doing anything, and therefore it doesn't matter if I rob this bank because it's not really me doing it. You know, it's just sort of a, it's happening, and uh, just as good as not robbing the bank. Uh, th there's a bit of research I thought you were actually going to refer to, which is uh, when you started to mention research, which is that they've discovered that the impulse to say mm -hmm. move your arm or something yeah. appears in the brain like several seconds before you actually have the conscious impulse, the conscious desire to, to move the arm. Um, yeah, and there are these fascinating experiments too where they they have some people who the, the two sides of their brain have been divided for one reason or another. Oh, right, yeah. Um, and so they, ha they I, I'll get this wrong because my memory of it, but it's something like the person, they show them flashcards that one side of the brain sees like the flashcard will say something like get up and go to the refrigerator and get a coke mm -hmm. and 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 the person will go and do that and then they'll come back and 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 they won't be able to remember because of the div division that that they did that because they saw it was you know on a flashcard yeah. and the, the researchers will say you know why did you go up why did you go and get a coke and the person will say i was thirsty you know the brain constructs. They won't remember that they had that in that yeah, instruction. Yeah, it, it doesn't really know why it did it, but it constructs what seems like a plausible explanation and believes its own explanation. Huh. So, you know, it's a lot. It's you know when you really start to look closely at 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 how things are unfolding, you really can begin to see that that um, you know it it like an addiction. You know, we say, well, I want to quit smoking, but I can't. But, you know, at, at some moments we want to we want to quit smoking, and then at another moment wanting to smoke overpowers wanting to quit smoking. Mm -hmm. You know, want, the wanting to smoke at that moment is, is stronger. Now, can we choose what we want? doesn't seem like it. I mean, it's just all of a sudden there's an overpowering urge, and sometimes there's an ability to whatever you know just sit down in meditation and feel the sensations of that urge and and sometimes that will work 
and we don't light up the cigarette. Um, or for some people, that works completely. You know, I mean, I quit smoking in 1974 and have never lit up again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I have friends who have tried to quit again and again and again, and they just can't. My father was like that. He, mm. he had, was dying of emphysema, and he was still running across the street to get cigarettes from the lady across the street every yeah. now. Conditioning is very powerful. It's, you know, and... Um, well, this whole discussion actually kind of points to an interesting point, which is that, um, you know, we... Th we think that we're in control of our world and we think that we've sort of got it all together and so on but really uh we've just all we are is like a little tiny peephole on the universe you know um, there's uh i mean even from a scientific perspective the the fraction of the of the total spectrum of light that we're able to see the fraction of of anything we're able to perceive through any of our senses is is such a minuscule amount compared to the the totality uh, that it 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 really does seem silly in that light to give such um, predominance to the individual authorship and and uh, are you still there your picture yeah. froze oh yeah I'm here I'm here oh good um, <laughs> and so it, I, to to my mind it kind of um, bolsters your point that. Um, you know, there really is no one running the show, and th there's a, it sort of helps to um, bring about that sort of relaxation into into what is and into. Um, I'm I'm not saying it as well as you do. But you, you, I'm kind of I'm fumbling here. What you know what I'm yeah. trying to say? Yeah, it's, yeah. Just, it's just all it's happening by itself. Yeah, yeah. Things happen automatically. It's all one whole happening, and yeah. including the thought um, that I have to do this. Yeah, yeah. And and the thought that creates this mirage of me, you know, like if I say something and then the thought pops, um, you shouldn't have said that. That thought kind of creates the mirage of me who chose to say that and could have said something better mm. and but <laughs> the thought just pops up and the mirage just pops up the whole thing happens by itself so so we just had a little technical glitch Joan and I and we probably just edited that out of this recording but um, I was getting very vague and rambling and trying to make some point about uh, the sort of uh, authorship of action, and perhaps Joan can come back and clarify what I was trying to say. And, uh, well, no, I think we had been sort of seeing that there was no, there's no one doing anything, that it's one whole happening. That's it. But there's still the appearance, uh, you know, of making choices. So, you know, when I was teaching grammar at a college um, a few years ago, I, I don't, I don't get up in front of my students and say. Um, there's no you, there's no way you can, you know, you're either going to learn this or you're not. You know, of course, I I say this is what you have to learn. This is what's in the homework for tonight. This is what you should go home and do um, because that's how this is functioning. Mm -hmm. But but when I really look back to see where all of those things are coming from, they're coming from the whole universe. They're coming from totality. They're not, there's no Joan in there. Mm -hmm. And whether my students are capable of doing the assignment or not, um, is also the the movement of life itself, and if I really see that, I'm you know, and if they fail to do the assignment, I'll still give them an F, but I'll be more compassionate. I'll have more understanding that um, the fact that they went home and didn't do the assignment was the only possible thing that could have happened for them at that moment. Mm. Doesn't mean I might not urge them to um, do better next time, but. Again, that urging, is, if it happens, is just happening. And whether they can do that or not is just happening. Yeah. Well, that's very good. I, I really enjoy that. and it, it, it helps me put things in perspective. I, I tend to get a little bit too judgmental sometimes about things. You know, I see Sarah Palin on television. And sort of, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, people just do what they do. And they... Yeah, and, and, my, and your, your response... Um, is also just happening, mm -hmm. you know. The the um, the she's just 
and movement of the universe and you know Rick's anger at her or Joan's anger at her <laughs> is also just the movement of the universe yeah uh, um, so beautiful well um, I, I really enjoyed this I, I apologize if at times I kind of became a little long-winded trying to um, state certain points that that was just the movement of the universe too I'm sure but yeah no I didn't think <laughs> uh, <laughs> you were great <laughs> thanks yeah it's a, I've really enjoyed talking with you. Sometimes when I try to express an abstract point, my mind kind of becomes abstract, and and I kind of lose the focus of what I'm trying to say. You know, it's it's a bit it's, of a balancing is, act. Well, and it's kind of interesting because you know when we're trying to say something, we're kind of like we're working on this sort of conceptual map world, you know. Yeah. And sometimes it just kind of disintegrates, and it's like we come to this place where, which right. is, you know, where. I don't know what's going on here, <laughs> which, is, which is really the truth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Huh. Interesting thing. Yeah. So, uh, so Joan um, lives out in Oregon. Do you give actual in-person satsangs, or you do stuff mostly um, on the phone or whatever by books? And I do. Um, I hold meetings here in Ashland, Good. Uh, and um, I do phone meetings with people and Skype meetings. Okay. Um, and write books. Yeah. So I'll be uh, linking to your website from batgap.com, and people can go there, and I'm sure they can get in touch with you through that uh, if they'd like to either come to a, a satsang or be in touch with you on phone or Skype. Um, and I will also link to your books uh, in case they would like to read them. Right. Um, yeah, you probably have some kind of mailing list or something where you notify people of... I do. I have I have an email list that if people just send me an email, they can get on the list, and then I hardly ever send out any emails. But if I'm going on a tour, which I hardly ever do, or yeah. if I'm if I'm coming out with a new book, which I do have two new books coming out next year, so if you know, then I send out an email and I let everyone know. What are they going to be about? Um, one of them is uh, about non-duality, and it's similar to my last book which mm -hmm. was a bunch of talks and dialogues about non-duality but the new one is not in dialogue form and it's much shorter uh -huh. and it's just sort of an attempt to put non-duality in a in a simple concise way yeah. and the other one which I'm still finishing up is more of a personal has more of my personal story in it like my first two books and and it focuses a lot on um, death and aging uh, and non-duality, but and they're coming out like in a year or so. You say they're supposed to both come out early in 2012. Hmm. Good. Uh, perhaps I'll read them myself. Um, okay, so uh, let's conclude. I've been talking with Joan Tolufson, and uh, this is a little interview series called Buddha at the Gas Pump. I think Joan is number 86 in the series, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, Next week, I will be interviewing a fellow named Krishna Gauchi, who actually lives in Portland, not far from you. Uh-huh. <clears throat> well, it's been really nice talking to you. Yeah, right? it's been great talking to you. I just want to say to people that, if, depending on how you're hearing this, you might be on YouTube or something. If you go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, you can see all the interviews there and um, sign up for a podcast if you wish. Uh, there's a little discussion group there that springs up around each interview people start talking about what was discussed and so on so you can hmm. participate in that if you like you can get on my email list which uh, goes out about once a week uh, announcing new interviews as they're posted um, so thank you for listening or watching thank you Joan and we'll see you next week okay